Circle centers for Cousins, a shot, and he scores. Dylan Cousins makes it 3-0 left. Lyra's going to take it coast to coast on a backhand, scores! The blue line, Vandalies the effort, tip, scores! Carson Folk is Mr. Teddy Bear! A deflect! He scores! It's over! It's over! Game 7, overtime! Hi, hello, and welcome. I am Zach Hodder, the manager of player development for the Western Hockey League, and your host for this week's episode of the WHL Podcast. I think we got a pretty good show this week. We got uh, a country music legend here in Canada, a man by the name of Gord Bamford. His son is a seventh-round draft pick to the Kamloops Blazers. We had a great conversation with him, as well as Edmonton Oil Kings first-round pick from the 2019 WHL Draft, Caleb Reimer. But as usual, before all of that, let's jump into the news and notes. The Memorial E Cup is well underway and six WHL clubs are moving on to the next round. Daniel Booker from the Tri-City Americans secured the Americans spot in the next round with a 2-1 shootout win over the Gulf Storm. Luca Burzan of the Brandon Wheat Kings beat the Cape Breton Screaming Eagles by a score of 4-2. Rhett Reinhardt narrowly edged off the Blainsville Armada with a 3-2 victory. Lucas Sevkovsky from the Medicine Hat Tigers got very lucky in a disputed contest that many are calling rigged in a 7-1 shellacking against myself. When reached for comment, I did say, I don't believe it, I don't trust it, and I think my controller was slower. But either way, Medicine Hat is on to the next round. Trevor Longo of the Vancouver Giants beat up the London Knights in a 4-0 victory. And Ty Yoder with the upset of the tournament beat Keyshawn Gervais in overtime of the Portland Winterhawks 3-2, sending Victoria on to the next round. For all the scores and updates, you can check out whl.ca. The reigning CHL goaltender of the year, Dustin Wolf, has been named to Team USA's preliminary roster for the 2020 World Junior Championships. Wolf represented Team USA at the 2019 World Junior Championships, where he appeared in one game earning a victory. This season, he's looking to take over the starting spot and help Team USA bounce back after a disappointing finish in last year's tournament. That is it for the news and notes for everything WHL. You can follow us on Twitter at the WHL. When you think about the Western Hockey League, who are the unsung heroes? Is it the volunteers, the parking lot attendants, maybe the off-ice officials? Well, if you picked any of those, go take a hard look in the mirror because it's clearly the mascots. Think about it. They're in a suit that hasn't been cleaned since the 90s. They have to deal with kids pulling on them, teenagers bothering them, and the visibility is so bad that walking is essentially an extreme sport. But despite all that, the mascots of the WHL have joined forces to raise money so that no child goes through this holiday season without a gift through the Tees for Toys campaign. Wow. Each of the 22 mascots across the WHL have designed their own unique Christmas themed t-shirts and $7 from the purchase of each shirt will be used to buy toys for underprivileged children in our communities. That's pretty neat. For more information and how you can participate in the Tees for Toys campaign and help your community, please visit whl.ca. Wow, great. I am very privileged today to be speaking with a 26-time Canadian Country Music Award winner. He's a multi-time Juno nominee. He is the only two-time Global Artist of the Year by the Nashville Country Music Association. His foundation, the Gord Bamford Foundation, has raised over $4 million for charitable causes across Canada. And his son last season was drafted by the Camelot Blazers in the seventh round. It is, of course, Gord Bamford. Gord, how are you doing? No, I'm doing good, you know, considering the... Uh this pandemic and uh, the lack of work for us, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's good. We're good, good here. And um, just making the best of being, being home, I guess for now. Well, let's talk about how right now, obviously your, your main job is touring as a country artist musician across Canada and the U S well, what are you doing right now to continue to develop your skills and make sure that when the pandemic is op- over, you're able to get back on stage in front of several thousand people and perform at the same level you were before. Yeah, well, ironically, I mean, I took last year off because we were in the studio and, you know, cutting a whole bunch of new music. And so I had like 40 new songs ready to go. And, you know, we got out on this Redneck tour, which was across Canada. We had, you know, 45 shows booked and we got three of them in and we stopped. So 
you know, I haven't been doing a lot other than, you know, we, we kept pretty busy with the driving stuff. We did what we could do, you know, to keep the band and crew working, you know, up through the summer. And we did a few little things within the parameters of what we could do, I guess. And, you know, I think I stayed busier, busier than most people, but that was a, you know, that was a lot to do with just keeping the team of, that we have working. You know, I've, I've had the band and crew with me for some 13 years, you know, so to, keep them busy and doing their thing is um was important obviously now last month we haven't been able to do anything so trying to keep uh you know the our skills up to playing a bit around the house and writing a few things here and there but mainly just been hanging out you know with being home it's it's different for my wife and me having me home all the time I mean I'm kind of like a like any athlete traveling a lot so it's uh it's a little different a little weird but it's been nice to catch up on some stuff here and but I'll be honest with you, I've kind of had enough of it. I'm ready to get back to work and, and uh, get this thing over with. Oh, Gord, it's Christmas time now. It's December 1st. Have you got all your Christmas shopping done with all this extra time? Yeah, well, that's going to be Thursday's project, I guess, for doing that. So, um, you know, we're, we love Christmas. It's our favorite time of year. So we're, I just got the, I just got the uh, snow and, and stuff off the lake. I wasn't sure I could get out there with the tractor, but it worked out. So I got that done a couple of days ago. So we got some sort of rink around here to play on. So. Oh, well, that's good for your son, Nash, who, of course, last season was the uh, seventh round pick of the Camus Blazers. And let's go back to your your experience with hockey. What was your experience growing up playing the game? And, and yeah. um, you know, what, what level did you end up getting up to? Yeah, I loved the game of hockey. I played, uh, you know, right up till junior. You know, went to a few camps and walk on camps here and there. But, you know, the game's changed so much. You know, I was more of a, you know, tough guy type crash and bang and be physical more – more than skilled and ended up playing junior B played played the junior B league and had a lot of fun. I think, you know, hockey at whatever level is important. You meet lots of friends and meet lots of people through it. So I think whatever level you're playing at, it's just, you know, we encourage our kids to do what they love. So for Nash, he's really fortunate, you know, he's skilled and, you know, worked hard and had a really good Alberta cup, I think was what kind of got him going in the draft and, you know, what an awesome organization that he's gone to. They've been awesome to work with and, you know, as as you know, you know when you get drafted, that's doesn't doesn't mean a whole lot. I mean, you, you're lucky to get drafted, but you, you gotta work hard, and you know you're in the system now. So he's actually the last few weeks headed out to Penticton. He's out there at the OHA um, Academy, and he's liking it. And they've kind of got a bubble out there, so I think he's fortunate. You know, he's been training five days a week, and they're now playing games within their own uh, within their own organization. So you know they're doing a good job out there to keep these kids training and I know other places are they can't even play so yeah he's working hard and hopefully he continues to uh to do that and I know his goal is to play in Kamloops over the next couple of years and it's up to him we'll see we'll see how hard he works and where he goes but we're we're happy he's there and we're excited for him and proud of him so we'll see we'll see what happens well Nash is working towards something just like I'm sure you were when you were his age working towards at that point maybe playing hockey but then also on the side you had this talent as a as an artist as a country musician when did you really realize oh man like I might be able to make a living out of this career yeah funny thing is is I you know I I actually played hockey and then it, I I went to Australia out of high school I was more of a, a higher end baseball player so I played over there in the pro league a little bit and kind of and I wrecked my arm and you know I wanted to be an athlete that's what I wanted to do was, was do something in the in the sports world but never really you know, played music in the 90s and sang and did my thing and seemed to be pretty good at it. But it was never really top of mind for me to, you know, be where I'm at today. It just, it wasn't like I got this dream, you know, and I'm going to make it happen. You know, it was kind of, oh, I guess I'll go do this. You know, and, and back when I got playing music, it was, you know, you could, the live music scene was massive across Canada. Literally, you could go every week, you could be playing in a bar somewhere or a club or Honky Tonk and so yeah we had our Suburban and our trailer and we you know four-piece band and we would go week to week we'd do the tour from Red Deer up to Edmonton to Grand Prairie to Port St. John and into Prince George and then we'd do the west and then do the east and I feel like that's how we got I got good at it you know I got four sets a night you know that was back when people were smoking in the bars and <laughs> I don't know how we did it but you know, we'd make our five or six hundred bucks a week and at the end of the week it'd be gone because we'd either drink it in beer or gamble it away or whatever we did, you know. So, uh, but it was a way to, you know, really hone our skills and get good in front of people. And I think, you know, they lack that today. I mean, there's there's not a lot, a lot of live 
music venues anymore for people to to go you know develop i guess you can say you know so for me i was lucky that way and then i met a guy uh, in nashville by the name of byron hill who I, I recorded one of his songs and he had songs written for george Strait. he produced gary allen um and he kind of i just actually searched him he wrote something on the internet about me and i just reached out to him and since then it's kind of been history making you know he was a big part of my development as a songwriter you know he really taught me how to write songs and he produced uh, my first three or four records and um was a really good mentor to me you know and uh he was he was incredible in that so off to nashville i went you know got connected with the right people and i think that's that's the key i think even as an athlete you know even as we talk about nash like being in that organization you know is, is key you know from what i see and you know the fact that you know he's going to have opportunities and and then, then you, you do what you can do with those opportunities. It's up to you. So that's for me, I had a lot of good opportunities along the way. And luckily I liked the business side of things too. So I, I was able to develop pretty much everything in house. So from my tour buses to my production to, you know, my record label. And then I, you know, I was able to do a partnership with Sony music for over a decade, which worked out great for both of us. And now since then I've moved on to a, a record label um, who actually bought all my stuff out. Um, and, did a joint venture and it's owned by the Ontario Teachers Pension, a company called Anthem Records. So that's where I'm at now. And uh, I can't complain. I mean, it's it's been a whirlwind and I've made a great living at it and got a lot of great music that's in the can. And we're looking forward to many more years and of playing music, hopefully get back on tour. And we're planning for a you know October, November arena tour next year if we can go. So hopefully we can. <laughs> Well, 40 new songs that's a double album right there that's yeah, I know, and i'm kind of doing that with it so it actually comes out in march so i'm excited the first single's out now called diamonds in a whiskey glass it's really really doing well and you know we're just gonna find a way like i know in alberta it was you know could play for 100 people so we'd do two or three shows a day you know i'm not against anything you know it doesn't have to be to a big big crowd it can be to three small crowds i mean we'll just find a way to go work and, and, you know, get our music out there and do whatever we can within, within the rules. And um, I think that's all you can do with it instead of sitting at home, just make it happen. So that's what we've been doing up till now. So hopefully, hopefully something happens here and there's a change in, in this whole pandemic and everybody can get back to work, including the hockey, you know, it's pretty boring around here watching reruns. And I think everybody dialed into the Tyson fight the other night. That's all they got anymore. So. <laughs> it was the Jake, the Jake Paul fight was the one that ended up yeah, being that, the, the real stunner. That was something else, eh? Oh, yeah. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, that was but, the, that, that and the Tyson interview before the fight. That was the best part. Oh, man, I wish I would have, you know, been alive in the 90s to see Tyson. I mean, I watch his highlights now, and it's just people aren't built like him. People don't punch like him anymore. It's he's unbelievable. A, he's a machine, eh? Oh, but much like, uh, much like an athlete, you know, an artist like yourself, you go through different stages in your career. You started this early stage, you're on the road every weekend, every day, like you said, going to these small towns, Fort St. John, and then you start to get better and then you start to have kids. So how has your evolution as an artist changed from when you first put out that first album compared to the album that you're about to put out in March here? Oh, I mean, I like you kind of hit it on the head. You just, you go through, you're always learning something. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you think you're at the top of your game or not. I mean, I'm always learning something every day, whether it be from the business side of things or, you know, the sounds of country music have really, really changed over the time I've been in it, you know, almost a decade and a half, you know, from hardcore country to tailgate country to pop country, you know, now it's kind of swaying back to a bit of everything, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, so you have to kind of be able to maneuver through all that and growing as a person, you know, you know, and being able to, be able to being able to be in the business as long as I have and, and stay at the, you know, trying to stay at the top is, is tough because there's lots of great, you know, young artists that are coming up behind you and, and technology and, and production and studio quality has gotten so much better since I started. So a lot of people are doing great stuff. So you just got to stay current and, and uh, you know, stay relevant because I'm not, uh, I'm not quite ready to, to quit yet. So we're, uh, we're going to go hard for another five or 10 years here. So, it's good. And then I think when you, you know, you have a family, I've got two young daughters as well. And, and then we raised our nephew. He, uh, my, my wife's brother passed away a number of years ago. So Riley we raised him. He's 21 now. He played hockey. So he played uh, junior A in Okotoks for most of his career. But so I think just growing as a person that way, like the things that life throws at you, you know, is, uh, 
it, it changes you and you, you know, your priorities become so much different as you get older. And, but the number one thing is, is making a living for, for these people. So you keep your business rolling and you, and you get into, you have opportunities that come your way just through, you know, the travel and the meeting of people. And, and it's been really, really good for sure. A lot of the people I've been talking to, people like yourself who are, you know, popular, they've been incredibly successful in their career. They always talk about, oh, it's about surrounding yourself with good people. It's about, you know, developing those relationships. And when I look at you and I look at the Gord Banford Foundation and just how, how much work you guys do with that organization, how many events you're at, how many charities you're supporting. I mean, it's not really a surprise that, you know, you're one of the most respected people, not just in country music, but I'd say in, uh, in the Canadian music scene. But for yourself, when you first started the Gord Banford Foundation, what was the original premise for you? And did you ever see it growing to where it is today? Yeah, no, no, thanks for all that. No, we just, it actually went years, years back. A friend of mine was working with me, you know, kind of day-to-day managing guy that, you know, I grew up around and, you know, we were like, hey, we should, we should start a golf tournament and give, try and give some money somewhere. Well, you know, great idea. So we start this tournament in Lacombe and, I think we raised like 75 grand that year. We're like, wow, people showed up and it was pretty cool. We had fun, we raised some money, you know, and then it just blew up just from there. Like it's literally, like you said, over $4 million. And it's just a prestige tournament to get into. People can't get into it. And, um, but I got a great, you know, great team that run it. Again, like a, a great lady that runs the foundation, and, um, takes care of it. It's a, it's a full-time job now. And, and then some great organizations we've been involved with. It's really, really uh, youth-driven, children, um, children's hospitals, Ronald McDonald houses, big brothers, big sisters. We, we build, you know, multi-use facilities in small towns for, for kids to play sports, wheelchair, wheelchair accessible parks, stuff like that. So um, a lot of the foundation stuff I do, I've had experiences in my life, you know, whether it be big brothers and sisters in sports and our youngest daughter spent time at the children's hospital in Calgary, which, you know, changed our life and, and, and seeing what happens there and just stuff that happens throughout your life that, you know, kind of makes sense to give back. And, and for me, it's like people buy tickets and, you know, that's how I make my living. They buy tickets or they buy the music and it only makes sense to give back to the people. And when you can do that, when you have the means to do that, I think it's really important. And, and it's something that I, I truly, enjoy and it's probably the proudest thing that I do you know from from a human being aspect of things that I get to do and that's been tough too though in this pandemic you know we've got all sorts of people we're supporting and of course not really been able to have our events that we put on that raise all the money is really tough and it's it's tough times but uh man I can't wait to get out of this thing because I think there's going to be lots of entertainment to be had and, and lots of fun to you know for me in the in the business I'm in to get out and make a impact again and people are probably going to want to be out, you know, doing that. So, uh, yeah, the foundation has been an incredibly good thing for lots of different people across Canada. But I think for me as a human being, it's, is most importantly, it's been really, really good. So it's great. When you think about getting back out, getting to get back on the course for the Gord Banford Foundation Charity Golf Tournament, uh, going to concerts again, who is somebody that you've been listening to over this pandemic that you really want to see live that maybe you haven't seen yet or you haven't seen in a long time play? You know, I've seen most of them or been around most of them, but uh, I like the John Party stuff that he's doing a lot of, even this Morgan Wall and stuff. I mean, it's kind of different than what I would do, but he seems to be really moving the needle. Um, yeah, the John Party would be a cool, cool tour to be on. Uh, Lee Bryce, who I've seen before, but uh, you know, there's a lot of good Canadians out there right now. Young, young ones that are coming up. This Tyler Joe Miller's doing really well with his stuff, and uh, you know he's he's hot. And we got a pretty cool announcement coming up next year with the iconic uh, Canadian country artist. That's pretty excited. I'm going to be going on tour with her, so uh, we're pretty excited about the announcement we're going to put out, and we got some music coming out together. So that's the one I think everybody should buy tickets to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tyler Joe Miller is really cool stories from uh, Langley, BC. He actually, he was working on his, on a site. He's a, I believe he's a carpenter in the lower mainland and he was on a work job and they played a song on the radio. And that was the first time he ever heard it was when he was at a job site. So like, I love stories like that. And for yourself, now that you're, I mean, a staple, an icon in the country music scene, people must ask you for advice, especially younger artists all the time. But what's yep. the best piece of advice that you've been given that, that you pass on to those, those younger artists? 
Yeah, I do. I get lots of, you know, it's tough to, I mean, I can give them advice from my side, but for me, it's just, I've always just kept it simple. That's kind of what people have taught me is keep everything simple and do, do what you're really good at. You know, don't chase the trends, you know, and, and I found myself doing that a little bit with some of this music over the years, which it's worked, but not like it, like the new stuff is back to what's really worked for me. And I think just staying true to how, what you do and, and how you believe in it and is important, you know, and then again, surrounding yourself with key people, the right people, and you'll go through lots of them. And, and, and fortunately for me, all those people that have been involved with me, I'm still friends with and vice versa. It's just, it's a natural transition, you know, it's to, to find the perfect team of people that, that you have, you know, I actually have a guy now that is running my business that uh, went to uh, division one um, school playing hockey down the States. So he's uh, he got his marketing degree and he's a hockey guy and he's been with me for about a year and a half now running everything. But so he went that route and, you know, it's taken that long to find the right fits, you know, especially in today's world with social media and marketing, it's, it's gotten so different, you know, that a guy like me is good on certain levels, but you know, you get these young guys like Mac who I got and he's, he's been killing it. So, so yeah, you know, just finding the right people is the key and, and then the right team of people and stick to, stick to what you're good at. You know, don't, don't chase, don't chase people around, just do what you're good at. And eventually if you do all that stuff and things work out, you don't, anything is you don't have to, you don't have to have top fives or top tens or number one hits to be successful. You just got to, build a fan base. You know, I've always said to myself, if I could, my goal had always been to build a fan base of 500 hard ticket sellers across or buyers across Canada, you know, so I go anywhere across Canada and sell 500 tickets. That's a really good living, you know, and fortunately for me, I've you know, surpassed that by a, f a fair bit, but it's within reach, you know, and that's just building a database of people that love what you do, you know, and, and you can do that today and through many different channels. So I just, uh, just do that. Yeah, it's, I mean, with all the streaming services, YouTube, everything, it's so, it's difficult to get through, but there's more platforms to get your music out. And you yeah. talk about not having number ones or top tens. My favorite artist is Jason Isbell, and I've never yeah. heard him on the radio. And he's, no, I mean, great. you talk about a guy with 500 diehard fans, he's probably yeah. got about 500,000 at this point. But, you know, my last question for you here, Gord, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but where is your favorite place? Where is the place you're most looking forward to playing when you can get back out on the road? I think we're, you know, I love the small rural towns, you know, and that's kind of our plan is to get out and do more of a broke down songwriter type thing, you know, before we hit this arena tour. But, um, you know, I love, I love the small town atmospheres, you know, that sort of stuff. And I think they're going to be in need of that. But, you know, the major festivals are great, like Country Thunders and everywhere is fun, you know, but for me, uh, probably those little rural towns is going to be exciting to go play them. And that was our plan anyways. So get them first and then go from there. I, th I think at this point we just, we're just fortunate. We're just going to be happy wherever we can go. I think, I think, you know, I think by the time we come out of this thing, it's going to be, you know, pushing two years before, you know, we can get out and play. And, and you look at a guy like me, I mean, we can survive that, but you know, you really feel for your team, your management, you know, you're, you're a band and you're, you know, guitar players and your road management crew. And like, that's all they do. I mean, you know, when you're a musician, it's a lifestyle, you know, it's not a typically the music business is a lifestyle, not a get rich business. So, you know, morally and mental health wise, it's hard, you know, not to be able to be out there doing what you love every day, you know, and, and uh, it'll be great when we can all get back to doing it. And I think we'll all be happy. It doesn't matter where we're at. I think we're going to be happy playing wherever. Well, Gord, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. For those who are listening, his newest single is Diamonds in a Whiskey Glass. He's got an album coming out this March. And look for tickets for a big tour surprise guest. Uh, that's going to be going on November, December. Very, very fortunate to have Gord Bamford on the show today. Thanks, Gord. Have a great rest of this holiday season. Yeah, thanks for having me. Merry Christmas to you and your family and everybody listening there. So, Big thank you to Gord Bamford and his team for setting that interview up. Up next, we've got the Edmonton Oil Kings first round pick from the 2019 WHL Bantam Draft. That is, of course, Surrey BC native Caleb Reimer. I'm joined today by the 18th overall selection at the 2019 WHL Bantam Draft. 
He looks like he's a big Vancouver Canucks fan, which I am already loving. He's from Surrey, BC, Caleb Reimer. Caleb, how have you been doing so far? Great. How are you? I can't complain. It's been tremendous weather here in Calgary, but let's get back to you and the start of this season. What's it been like going back to Delta Hockey Academy for your second season as you wait for the WHL season to commence? Uh, it's been great. Uh, the staff and everyone there has um, really been doing their best to make it feel like a normal year. And I, I feel like everything is going as good as it possibly can there right now. You know, looking back at last year, obviously it was a shortened season, but you still got most of the regular season in and a couple of playoff games. Where do you think you developed the most as a player last year? I think my, my skating has gone a lot better since my bottom year. Just being solid on the puck and uh, not being as easy to, you know, push around. Yeah, a few things you might have learned when you went to the Oil Kings training camp last season was that, uh, you know, you're a big kid for Bantam and Midget age, but once you get to the Western Hockey League, most of the kids are the same size as you. Some are bigger, some are stronger, but what were your takeaways from that first training camp? Just the, like you said, the size and uh, the speed that all those big guys play at that I need to get to, that they, they all move just as good as the, the small guys, so I have to get to that level. And what do you think you need to do to make the team this season when you do get to training camp? Just uh, be a physical, be a physical force, uh, play my power forward game, make wreck havoc in front of the net, uh, assert myself, and, you know, hopefully everything works out. Well, you know, for people who haven't seen you play before, can you describe the type of player that you are? I'm a, I'm a big, strong centerman, I'd say, for, for my age. I, I can, I'm starting to move better. I stay in front of the net a lot. I, on the power play, uh, set myself up. And uh, I've got good hands in front, so I bury a lot of those rebounds. Well, that's exactly what they're looking for there. Kurt Hill and his group with Jamie Porter. I mean, they put together not just good teams, but great picks where they've been. You know, you're an 18th overall selection, which is a really good pick where they got you. Same with last year when they picked Dawson Seitz. But let's move away from the rink. Obviously, you know, that's your whole life right now. But there is life after hockey and there's life outside of hockey. So let's kind of get to know a little bit about yourself. What's your favorite movie? I'd say movie slash TV series. I watch a lot of uh, a lot of Modern Family and Schitt's Creek. Ah, uh, two very good shows. Yeah, always always on in the house. Right now we're in the pandemic. We're in you know restricted capacity events. But when we are able to go to the rink and go to the concerts again, who's a band or musician that you want to go see live? Uh, I definitely want to go see Luke Combs live, and um, also uh, I'm a, I'm a big country guy, so Morgan Wallen as well. Oh, you must be excited to be moving to Edmonton then. I actually just yeah. spoke with Gord Bamford. What's your special, do you have a hidden talent? Not exactly. Uh, uh, I play a lot of basketball. My dad went to college for basketball. So I grew up playing that. And there was a point where I was deciding either to play basketball or hockey. So I can, I can play basketball. Well, that ties in nicely with my next question. Who's your favorite athlete outside of the NHL? Uh, definitely LeBron James or... Um, Damian Lillard. Well, Caleb, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. It's officially December, so happy holiday season. Merry Christmas if your family celebrates it, and I hope you have a really good time before you go to Edmonton. Same to you. Merry Christmas. That is it for the podcast this week. Thank you to Caleb Reimer and Gord Bamford. You can catch Gord's newest song, Diamonds in a Whiskey Glass, wherever you get your streaming from. You can follow me on Twitter at Zach Hodder. You can follow the Western Hockey League at the WHL. If you're not big on social media like traditional websites, you can head to whl.ca. I hope you're having a great week. I hope it stays great as you get through hump day. And we'll see you again here next Wednesday.